Hey guys, thanks for taking the time to check out my video. Um, this is going to offer definitive proof of evolution. Now, make no mistake, evolution's already been proven beyond all reasonable doubt. This is evidenced by the fact that 99.98% of the scientific community accepts evolution, or the fact that the National Academy of Sciences last year named it as one of the top five most influential and valuable scientific disciplines. But nonetheless, this is going to offer four irrefutable arguments for evolution that can simply not be explained by creationism. There's no way. These are the four nails in the coffin, if you will. So in this video, I'll not only be presenting those four nails in the coffin, if you will, for evolution, I'll also be presenting popular creationist rebuttals to them, if they have them, and showing you why those are comical at best, and showing you how to refute them as well. So the four proofs that I have are, one, Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA, two, a chromosomal fusion in our lineage, three, retroviral DNA, and four, summation. So to begin, let's discuss Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA. Now, Neanderthals were a fascinating group of hominids who disappeared roughly 40,000 years ago. They were so sophisticated, in fact, that they had music, art, buried their dead, had other assorted rituals, and cared for their handicapped. Now, this poses a problem for creationism because the, the Bible doesn't mention hominids that did that yet were created and were not human. So most will allege that they are purely human. Well, quite a blow came to the creationists recently when mitochondrial DNA from Neanderthals was sequenced. And we found out that not only were they not human, they were very not human. Now, don't get me wrong, scientists have known that Neanderthals weren't human for a long time due to comparative anatomy, among other things. But this was a definitive nail in the coffin. One creationist suggested that they could have possibly been contaminated by modern DNA. Well, that would make the samples appear more human, not less human. So that's completely blown out of the water. Furthermore, contamination is not an issue because the sequencing took place in two simultaneous trials at different parts of the world, each getting the identical result. And again, these are also confirmed by subsequent Neanderthal specimens that have had their DNA sequenced as well. So again, contamination is not an issue. Now for a rebuttal to my Neanderthal argument, I actually debated with Dr. Jonathan Safradi at the beginning of this month, that's December of 2007, and he essentially raised four main points um, as far as why the Neanderthal evidence was false. Firstly, he said that they were very smart and listed a bunch of other human-like qualities, which nobody disputes and says nothing about the DNA. Secondly, he said the samples could have been contaminated, but again, that would make them appear more human. Thirdly, he said the Bible said so. And fourth, he said that the variation that we see is in the realm of what we see in modern human variation. Well, this image right here, published in Cell a couple years ago, completely blows that argument out of the water. As you can clearly see, that the variation between human, human, and human in the Neanderthal aren't even close. Despite pushing it several times, Dr. Safradi had no response or no rebuttal whatsoever for my arguments. Now the second nail in the coffin evolution has supporting it is the presence of fused chromosomes in our genome. Dr. Ken Miller of Brown University does a fantastic job of explaining this, so I'll simply turn it over to him. The second thing that you saw at the trial was that when data was introduced at the trial, which I and another witness introduced from whole genome sequencing, the intelligent design advocates just literally had nothing to say. We weren't asked questions in cross-examination. The other side never brought it up. They never argued against it. They just left it. Here's an example. Um, many of you may know that a few months ago, the genetic code of the chimpanzee was published. Therefore, we can compare our genome to these primate relatives. What do we find? I want to show you one striking finding that dates to about a year ago. You all know that evolution argues that we share a common ancestor with the great apes, the chimpanzee, the gorilla, and the orangutan. Well, if that's true, there should be genetic similarities. And in fact, there are. But there's something that's really interesting and has the potential, if it were true, to contradict evolutionary common ancestry. And that is, we have two fewer chromosomes than the other great apes. We have 46, they all have 48. That's very interesting. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, um, the 46 chromosomes that we have, you got 23 from mom and 23 from dad. So it's actually 23 pairs. These guys have 24 from each parent, so they have 24 pairs. So everybody in this room is missing a pair of chromosomes. Now, where did it go? Could it have gotten lost in our lineage? Uh-uh. If it got lost, if a whole primate chromosome was lost, that would be lethal. So there's only two possibilities. And that is, if these guys really share a common ancestor, that ancestor either had 48 chromosomes or 46. Now, if it had 48, 24 pairs, which is probably true, because three out of four have 48 chromosomes, what must have happened 
is that one pair of chromosomes must have gotten fused. So we should be able to look at our genome and discover that one of our chromosomes resulted from the fusion of two primate chromosomes. So we should be able to look around our genome. And you know what? If we don't find it, evolution is wrong. We don't share a common ancestor. So if, how would we find it? Well, biologists in the room will know that chromosomes have nifty little markers. They have markers called centromeres, which are DNA sequences that are used to separate them during mitosis, and they have cool little DNA sequences on the end called telomeres. What would happen if a pair of chromosomes got fused? Well, what would happen is the fusion would put telomeres where they don't belong in the center of the chromosome, and the resulting fused chromosome should actually have two centromeres. One of them might become inactivated, but nonetheless, it should still be there. So we can scan our genome, and you know what? If we don't find that chromosome, evolution's in trouble. Well, guess what? It's chromosome number two. Our chromosome number two was formed by the fusion of two primate chromosomes. Uh, this is the paper from Nature a little more than a year ago. And I put up a little of the paper. I'm sorry it's technical, but look at what it says. Chromosome two is unique to our lineage. It emerged as a result of the head-to-head -head fusion of two chromosomes that remain separate in other primates. Those of you who have not kept up with how much we know about the genome uh, should pay attention to this, because you'll be amazed at how precisely we can look at things. The precise fusion site has been located at base number 114,455,823, 214,455,838. In other words, within 15 bases. And you'll notice multiple subtelomeric duplications, the telomeres that don't belong. And lo and behold, um, the centromere that is inactivated corresponds to chimp chromosome 13. It's there. It's testable. It confirms the prediction of evolution. How would intelligent design explain this? Only one way, by shrugging and saying, that's the way the designer made it. No reason, no rhyme. Presumably, there's a designer who designed human chromosome number two to make it look as if it was formed by the fusion from a private ancestor. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm a theist. In, in the broadest sense, I would say I believe in a designer. But you know what? I don't believe in a deceptive one. I don't believe in one who would do this to try to fool us. And the only thing that I have seen resembling an attempt to rebut this information is from Casey Luskin of the Idea Center, who essentially says, so what? There's a fusion. That doesn't necessarily mean that it came from a common ape ancestor. We just know that we have a fusion. Well, what he completely neglects and ends up negating his argument is the fact that we have the precise fusion sequence and can tell exactly where it occurred. And with that information, you can disregard the rest of his argument. The third piece of evidence, completely for evolution, comes in the form of endogenous retroviruses, or ERVs. Now, typically when a virus invades a cell, it does its dirty work and the organism isn't too happy. However, in the case of ERVs, the virus becomes inactivated, and instead its genetic material is integrated onto the host DNA, or genome. Now, that's exactly what this illustration is showing you. Now, if that happens in a body cell, the change is lost whenever the organism perishes. However, if it happens in a negrous sperm, that information is permanently not where it's supposed to be. We've got viral DNA in our genome, and that is passed down to all of the organism's progeny, all of its children and children's children, so on and so forth. It doesn't go away. So to put this in perspective, the human genome is 3 billion base pairs long, and an ERV is typically 500 base pairs. So what are the odds of a human and a chimpanzee getting just one ERV in the same place, that's a 500 base pair sequences, and, and all of the 3 billion base pairs that it can pop in, that it would, the same one would pop in on the exact same spot on both of them. It's non-existent. Well, what about for two? What about for three ERVs? What about for 14? What's more is that viral DNA comprises 4% of the human genome. Creationism simply can't account for this. And what's more is the fact that all of the data that we can gain from ERVs, such as the location, type, and size, correspond perfectly to the phylogenetic trees which have been comprised by evolution. I mean, this is an independent method completely verifying all of evolution, which brings me to my next point, which I'll discuss in the next video, that is summation. And ignite.